Hello and welcome to another spoiler episode of Umaneko. This video will be covering episode 3, parts 9 and 10 of my Let's Play. As usual, do not watch, do not continue to listen, do not go any further if you have not played the full game. It will be full of spoilers and will be confusing to someone who doesn't actually know what's going on already. Also, content warnings in this video for discussions of child abuse and bullying. One thing that's very interesting to look at in these two videos is the relationship between Rosa and Ava. I've talked separately before about their differing approaches and their different situations and what makes sense for them and what they try to do and etc etc. But it's made pretty stark in this one of how they interact and directly conflict about things. Early on, when they're just puzzling through the epitaph and talking about it, Kyrie gives her opinions, gives her hints and kind of her early reading of the epitaph. At that point, Ava's incredibly invested in, at all costs, solving the epitaph because, of course, she wants to be head. Rosa is not. Rosa simply does not envision a future in which she is the head. Regardless of solving the epitaph, and she says this herself later, she's not going to become the head. Ava has an uphill struggle to try and become the head herself. Rosa would have to fight three older siblings. And if you think about how hard Ava's already fighting Krauss, Groza can see exactly what energy would be directed at her if she attempted to take the place of the head. So to her there is no notion of this being an ambition. Like I said before, she takes she takes up her work as a, in a design job. Some of the comments pointed out that that's partly to do with her absentee partner. But um, we'll get to that I think maybe next episode is what they were saying. So that'll be interesting to poke at at the time. but. Broadly speaking, she has chosen to she has chosen to not upstage her siblings. She is not operating in fields where they would theoretically feel threatened. Going for the headship is no different. Ava does not see this. Ava only sees someone who doesn't care. Ava only sees someone who gives up too easily, is uninvested and passive. Ava doesn't understand the extent to which that passivity is a very intentional, and not only intentional, it is intentionally being displayed to her because Ava is one of the bigger threats to Rosa's security. <laughs> to Ava, it feels like proof of Rosa being foolish and having no drive. Ava simply asks, good grief, how can you be like that? And realistically, if you think about it, Rosa could be just as easily asking Ava that same question. Do you really think you'll get the headship? Do you think there'll be a seamless transition of power if you solve this riddle? Do you actually think this puzzle, this like silly game, is genuinely going to achieve your lifetime ambition? Do you think that to achieve that, the only way to do it is to be ruthless, cutthroat, and doggedly pursue it? There's nothing inherently silly about Rosa taking a back seat on this stuff, but to Ava it's utterly unthinkable because she simply can't operate like that, otherwise she would have never gotten anywhere with her ambition. And again, a very revealing line in the narration is that when Ava kind of badgers Rosa about this, the narration says Rosa hung her head unsure as to how she should answer. Yet again, we see that Rosa is concerned with what she should be doing, what she is prescribed to be in this position. This conversation, this argument begins with Rosa saying, oh, should we as the women go help with breakfast? Should we go do food prep with the other women who are also doing food prep? And Ava is extremely uninterested in what she should be doing because she has known for a long time that doing what she should do does not really get her much of what she actually wants. And a lot of the promises of what she should do and why ring pretty false. Early on in the kind of uh, flashback sequence where Klaus is being a huge misogynist to her, he makes the claim that 
she needs to work on her womanly charms because she'll never bag a husband without doing that. Her and Hideyoshi have probably the strongest relationship of all the siblings. We're going to talk about that a little bit more later too. But it is clear that Hideyoshi is not repelled by Ava's behavior or by Ava not being a wonderful cook or anything. Because also these are rich people, they don't need to cook for themselves. So a lot of the claims about what someone should be doing and why have much more to do with posturing than actually things that are beneficial to them, or they will actually lead to the rewards that are often claimed and associated with those things. And Ava knows that, and is not interested in going along with it. However, she fails to understand the position Rosa is in, and interestingly, is even technically arguing against her own interest by saying, shouldn't you fight for the headship? As if Ava wants to have another challenger to have to deal with. And of course, at the end of the conversation, Rosa in fact has a pretty intelligent clue that leads to Ava being able to get the Golden Land, without which, would she even have solved it? It's debatable but it was definitely a huge help in getting her where she's going, and Rosa is offering it up because her older siblings, who often change their minds, offer contradictory ideas, and will go back and forth on what they want and expect of her, has suddenly insisted that she should show her intelligence. She then does. She reveals something that she had thought, that she didn't have a lot of confidence in bringing up, because if it turned out to be useless or false or nothing, then her siblings would just scoff at it and verbally slap her for even bringing it up. However, it is actually a very useful, important piece of advice. And also, it is not an empty fear, the idea of being scoffed at, because Ava was snapping at Krauss for interrupting Kyrie earlier in this very conversation. And all of this will again come into play later, when Ava finds the Golden Land, Moments later, Rosa follows her. Clearly, Rosa has also solved the riddle, but not quite quick enough. But even in that scene, there's still a disconnect where Rosa's very happy with the idea that Ava gets to become the new head. Rosa, in fact, specifically says she's glad that Ava could become the head and knock Krauss off his pedestal. Because, again, Rosa has no notion that she could ever be the head. Likewise, Rosa does not have a notion of taking all of the gold for herself. Now, had she found it first, maybe that would change. Maybe how she feels about it would be different in that case. But in this, in this version of events, she is very happy about the idea of sharing it. Because that is the lot in life for a youngest sibling. She's never had a notion of being able to be greedier than that, because they would simply not allow it. The idea of sharing it quite evenly between the four of them is more than she could ask for. And despite their claims of trusting each other the most of any of their siblings, they are both wary of each other in this standoff scene. Of course, that doesn't mean that their claims are false, they may in fact both trust the other more than their other siblings, but that might not mean much given uh, how untrustworthy as a whole they find each other. And the misunderstanding of motives is a key part to the distrust or the gap in trust, because part of why you can trust someone is by understanding them. If you know their motivations, their feelings, their desires, their wants, you then have an easier way of kind of following, like, okay, I can trust you because I know you, I like understand you as a person, and I can then rely on your, I can rely on my understanding of you and your actions, and I feel comfortable with you. The Ashuramias do not feel comfortable with each other, they have not had that kind of upbringing or relationship with each other, but they also just don't even quite understand each other enough to then go, I know how this will go. Rosa is not aware of the ways that Ava's trauma leads her to now have her childish self take charge and decide that simply being the head and having lots of gold is not enough. 
She must be the master of the entire pile of gold. What you could easily describe as more money than they could have imagined? Each. She wants it. She wants it all. She wants four times more money than she could have ever imagined. And that segues a little bit into a conversation between Beatrice and Virgilia, where Beatrice is showing her more childish side that she won't let slip to battle her, but is openly doing in front of Virgilia. And specifically, Virgilia harps on a general theme and a general point of confusion I had when reading through for the first time, where... Virgilia points out that Beatrice has lost sight of what her goal for the game was. Beatrice says, what, what victory conditions are there other than making Battler surrender? And then Virgilia's like, okay, well, that's not, that's not even an actual victory condition. That's not right. Because Beatrice wants to have Battler accept her and see her and believe she exists. A forceful means of doing that is not really actually going to mean much. It would be a hollow victory if she got it, and it was a hollow victory when she got it last episode, because that's why she let him keep playing. He lost, but she was not satisfied. And yet, she has not quite copped to that either. She decided for episode 3 she was going to do the same thing again, and it's like, well, one, it's not working because he's now figured out a bit and he's gotten some hints and help to avoid falling into the constant pitfalls he's been falling into. But for two, if it did work, we'd just be at the same place we were at the end of episode two. So where are you going with this? And when Virgilia tries to point out this, Beatrice is offended at the immediate assumption that Virgilia is suggesting that she bodies him up and begs him to accept her. Again, not quite comprehending that there's a version of events that might be more amicable, that might be more communicative, collaborative, that the only version of events is a forceful submission, or for her to beg. For her to effectively submit and surrender with the notion being that she's surrendering in order to beg a win out of him. As we get scenes of Ava with Ava Beatrice, even though she's not yet Ava Beatrice, I'm just going to continue saying her, I'm just going to continue referring to her that way, you can see the ways in which Ava's harshness is not projected only upon other people. Ava is also very harsh on herself in similar ways. Ava, who has been up all night under Schrodinger's threat of murder, is tired and is racking her brains to solve a riddle that is confusing and she herself says, Legit, we don't know if this is solvable. We don't know if we have access to the information we need. We don't know if there is a real solution. We don't know if there is a solution where when we have found it, we will know it is found. She says that a wire puzzle would be simpler because a wire puzzle has a clear end goal. A wire puzzle has a very specific physical manifestation where you can look at it and know how it is done and when it is done. Much like her, all her life trying to become the head by other means, she might be throwing herself at a problem that can never be solved. She might be throwing herself at an immovable object. And she is describing these worries out loud in her head, while Avatris is simply going, well, if you're gonna be a pansy and give up this fast, you should go die. She is relentless in her criticism and deeply harsh. And this is what she uses to get herself to continue. This is what she uses to fight through the doubts about something even being solvable or being difficult or confusing because at the end of the day she still has to try because the potential for if it is solvable and she does get that goal is immense and also the prospect of it being solvable and someone else solving it it would be such a disaster to her 
But the other thing Apatris does is she does also praise Ava and big themselves up because she will say, we're pretty smart so our ideas are solid. She is encouraging about the behaviors that can lead to good results. She is saying, we are smart, we can solve this riddle. It is not impossible. And then even finds ways to belittle the puzzle itself, calling it childish, saying that all men, no matter how old they get, are children. She is turning back the kind of condescending oppression that she has gotten as a woman her whole life. Society, and especially the Ashermia family, loves to infantilize women and treat them as trivial and small and nothing and practically below attention most of the time. Avatris is here going, you think this is a massive riddle of the epitaph, but it's a child's riddle. This is a silly thing that your old father, who's still a child himself, cooked up. Her specific line, throw away your awe of father. Think of this like it's a worthless infantile game with riddles. And again, this is motivating because to Ava, this undercuts her doubts and concerns and lets her just cut through to try and find solutions that, of course, she is able to find. And I will just briefly touch on the ending scene where Avatris is being crowned as the new Golden Witch. Valor being baffled and then Virgilia just answering, uh, treat it like it's a metaphor. It is very funny. But I do also like it as a small microcosm of where Battler's journey will ultimately be going because he is confused and suspicious, wondering if it may in fact be some sort of trick or ploy that he shouldn't fall for and that he should be resistant and object to. And even when he does not have much understanding or insight as to what in particular is going on, he is at least able to look at the situation and go, well this is my Aunt Ava and she seems happy so, gonna be honest, I'm gonna clap for her good for her and just applauds and in this moment he specifically says that he's not accepting witches because he still just doesn't quite fully understand but he will clap for her because whatever is happening he understands that it matters to her and she's happy about it and then of course the, scene, the very ending narration of the scene is it was, as, it was just as though Battler and Beato's applause had been the final thing needed for her succession. A little bit of a hint that of course, for Ava to be the witch, she needs people to accept her. She cannot become the witch if people are going to deny her. Battler's acceptance is important. He may just be a person, but if he was going to go around denying her, that would undermine the self-actualization going on in this scene. He does not yet realize that this all holds true for Beatrice just as well, but he is going to find out. We go back to inside the guest house where everyone is now indoors again, and there is general tension where none of these siblings trusting each other, no one really wants to go asleep or go and be fully absent for any significant periods of time. And in particular, Ava and Rosa both know to an extent that there's some other shit going on, but are not clear what the other is planning to do or say. And so neither of them wants to leave and let the other be unsupervised for any extended period of time for fear that something foolish might happen. And again, all of this is happening under the backdrop of none of these people have been sleeping since the night before. None of these people even slept the night before. So it's bad times all around. It, the tension becomes so blatant. In a, and I find a very fun part is when Ava says what seems like a pretty innocuous response to Rosa of thank you, we'll all take those words to heart and rest for a while. After basically they've been staring daggers at each other but saying seemingly innocuous things, Hideyoshi responds with, What is it, Ava? Why so angry all of a sudden? Uh, he's picked up on the vibes immense. He is immediately picked up on the vibes. He knows his wife. 
He knows when she is being aggressive and he needs to tell her to cool it. And he knows when she's angry. This is not... Despite being such an innocuous sentence, he knows that there's more going on here. And there's other times where he'll tell Ava, like, hey, cool it, stop it, stop being so rude to people. But he doesn't call her angry in those cases. He was just like, just calm it down, turn it down a bit. This is... Oh, jeez, you're angry. And then it immediately is like, we need to go rest. The two of us are going to have to evacuate here. We gotta get out of this situation. Of course, that leads to a very sweet scene of Eva and Hideyoshi where she is in bed, she is feeling sick and feverish, and the only thing helping her is his special cooling hand. Now, we're going to have to talk about this in the how of the mystery section later, uh, which I don't think will be very long either, but in this moment the dynamic is very nice where... In this moment, the dynamic is very sweet, where he is providing what she needs. He is putting his hand to her forehead because she feels ill, and the only thing making her feel better is clearly not the physical presence of a hand, so much as the fact that her husband is there to care for her and is supporting her in whatever way he can, exactly as much as she wants it. Now, we have talked before about the magical narratives that can surround many things, one of which is the idea of being feverish. Of course, if you are ill, certain kinds of illness or certain kinds of illness can lead to having a fever. It is a symptom of multiple things. However, it also is the kind of thing where one can simply claim it or someone can be distraught, someone might just be tired and hungry. And you might then just feel off and then describe that as feverish and then suddenly you decide that you are sick. Someone might be struggling with their conflicted desires and intentions. Someone would be struggling with a difficult situation. And that might be enough to have them feeling poorly. Now, in a sense, they are still sick, but you can understand why, given this kind of situation, Hideyoshi's hand is... V Hideyoshi's hand is what she wants rather than a doctor, because she does not think that anything physically needs to be dealt with, so much as Ava is having some thoughts about what to do and how to handle this situation. And she is struggling with two versions of herself and which she should be. Now, obviously, it comes to a head later, but even here, it does feel like it's setting up that situation rather than her, rather than her being physically ill. Ava tells Hideyoshi about Ava Triss, the Ava she had in her head when she was younger, the witch who drove her to achieve things that were otherwise impossible. He tells her this story, and there's a funny moment where he is basically going along with her story and being like, yeah, you're you're a force to be reckoned with. And but there's a point at which Ava is distancing herself from this witch and thanking the witch. Thanking the witch that she brought her thanking the witch that she brought Ava to Hideyoshi. Hideyoshi says she's too timid when she's sick. This strange kind of vulnerable honesty is not wholly out of character for Ava, but it is it is unusual enough that it bears saying, and I think in part it is to do with a split, where to an extent Ava Triss has Ava's more ambitious, aggressive, and driven side, and by contrast then that leaves Ava with other parts of her. Ava is a person who can be timid and compassionate and all of those things are still within her. They're just not evoked and brought out as much, especially not on screen for the events of the game here, you'll see. And again, bordering on the uh, how it was done section that will appear at the end of this. Part of why Ava wants this hand here, I believe, has to do with forming an alibi for certain events that we're about to get to. In a sense, that is still protecting Ava, that's providing support that otherwise would not be possible, 
and it is the kind of support Hideyoshi is always willing to offer Ava. He is in her corner, he is there for her. He likes the Ashuramiya family broadly, but Ava is the one he loves. But the other dimension to this, too, when talking about the splits of Ava, Ava Triss, Ava, the one sick in bed, being timid and weak, and to an extent I read that weakness as being that it is not the dominant side of her. It is not the side that controls her body in this section. But more than that even, Ava wants Hideyoshi to keep his hand there because she wants to be anchored. She doesn't want to be pulled away. She wants that side of her to still be there, even as much as the witch Ava is very powerful and has a strong pull to a certain direction that we're going to see Ava fall further into. Then of course, Ava gets to play with Rosa. This section highlights something that came up a little bit before, where Rosa would talk about Ava going against the rules that the sibling set up, and Ava just not being concerned with rules as a concept the way Rosa was. Ava Triss herself uh, comes to realize that she's been told all her life that you cannot break things or kill people because they cannot be restored. But then if she's a witch and can restore them, then she can just break them as much as she wants, and there's no longer anything wrong with it. Which serves to underscore something interesting about morality and rules, or morality and laws, where rules and laws can sometimes distract from the actual moral principle of a situation. You shouldn't kill people or break things because of the harm it causes. The fact that it is irreparable harm makes it worse, but the actual reason you shouldn't do it is because it's harmful. What Ava Beatrice is doing is still harmful. Even if she revives Rosa over and over again, even if she can somehow wipe Rosa's memory, the harm still happened. There was still a Rosa who experienced those things and had to deal with them. That hasn't gone away. But because Ava Trist learned, well, you shouldn't kill people because then you can't undo it, means that, well, by Hempel's Raven, if you can undo it, then you should kill people. Yet again, a case where logic can be a dangerous tool when it's wielded very foolishly. And it is definitely a childish read of these things because, again, like many of the logic arguments, if you think sensibly or if you think practically or pragmatically about the actual situations and implications of an argument, the logic can fall apart because it's silly and no longer applicable. But if you are a child who only has to care about the logic because you're selfishly seeking a result where you get to say that it's okay to kill people, then you will do that. Of course I said even if Ava Triss was wiping Rosa's memory there would be harm done. She is absolutely not wiping Rosa's memory. Rosa retains the feelings and experiences of every single time this happens. It does not go away. And Ava Triss is unconcerned with this fact. And this is, uh, and there's some clear parallels in this section about Ava Triss bullying Rosa being a thing Ava did in general growing up, but also being a thing where Ava taught that kind of cruelty to Rosa too. Where they, Ava Triss talks about how they would throw butterflies into spider webs intentionally to get the spiders to eat the butterflies. Now that's quite cruel, it's cruel to insects, so I mean for the most part people would kind of consider that as not a problem. But maybe you would not feel quite so similarly if Avatris was making the argument that the difference between a witch and a human is the difference between a human and an insect. The scale does not matter to the victim. The scale is a justification that the bully will use. And Beatrice is just such a kind of bully. Beatrice it thinks this is all in good fun because Beatrice, Beatrice as a character has operated in the role of the bully. And to an extent, I'm increasingly feeling like Beatrice, the meta-construct character that engages with Battler in this game, 
is trying to distance herself and forget about the ways in which she has been a victim. Being a victim does not excuse being a bully as well. It complicates the situation in terms of thinking about her motivations and what drove her to do this and how culpable she is. But she is trying to ignore that and only think from the perspective of the bully having fun. Battler, who cannot at all see things from the bully perspective, is repulsed by this and shocks her into not even fully recognizing the alternative point of view here, but that there is not... A she realizes that there is an alternative point of view and that not merely her idea of the situation. Baby steps, I suppose. And in part, Beatrice here, despite being the thousand-year-old witch, maybe because she is the thousand-year-old witch, thinks that all's well that ends well, that if you wipe the slate clean after, none of it truly matters, does it? This is maybe the kind of thinking you would have if you've been doing a kind of time loop situation where at the end of a loop you go back and no one remembers the previous loop. Except that's not true. Beatrice remembers, Battler remembers, Shannon and Cannon also remember, so it's a good chance, at the very least, Genji might also know. There may be a degree of resetting involved, but again, the experiences happen and they do not get undone, they simply get rewound. Of course, this leads to a big argument with Battler, as well as Virgilia and Granove, both largely siding with Battler and leaving. Beatrice is somewhat humbled, and I think a particular point that underscores how she has realized that she has turned herself from a victim into a bully is the moment where she has to herself kill Rosa and Maria in order to enact the second Twilight in a much cleaner and simpler way, where Maria says, I thought we were going to the Golden Land, you promised me, and Beatrice who has a particular investment in the idea of promises, has to acknowledge that the promise she made was made in a different situation, and things have changed, and she can no longer keep the promise that she made. That has to feel bad for Beatrice, who has a broken promise as a core part of her motivation. And we will see more of the cycle that this spins out into in future in future updates, but a little bit too late, Beatrice starts to realize, hey, Avatrice, I'm not an example, you should not follow me, you should not be doing the shit I do. Don't, do not just follow in my footsteps. And it's a little bit too late because, <laughs> for whatever reason, Renove has already been telling her all the shit that uh, Beatrice got up to in episodes 1 and 2. <laughs> so. Avatrice is already enamored, and uh, that genie doesn't go back in the bottle. That comes to the end of this section, and now I have a pretty brief how it was done. Now, obviously we have not seen the crime scene. Obviously these videos have not seen the crime scene and shown the red truths, so I will probably comb back over this for next time, especially because there will be more murders to cover next time, and. I often find, holistically, there's a lot more to talk about when you get to see the whole of the murder mystery. But I'm pretty sure Ava did it. <laughs> From the first Twilight, Beatrice's body survived, even though the six persons all died. Again, there may be something about Ranove or Virgilia also being around. For, in Virgilia's case, I think the narration has made it more... In, the narration has me more inclined to believe that she, her body is also dead. Granove is the possible exception, but more likely, I think it is mostly, that Beatrice's body, Canon Shannon's body, is still up and about, and is ready to be an accomplice. Whether or not that's a direct accomplice that is intentionally engaging with Ava, will be interesting to find out. 
I would not be surprised if there is an unseen meeting where Beatrice may have been waiting in the Golden Land and we didn't get to see Ava meet her, but I'm not really counting on that per se until we get to later murders where it definitely requires an additional person. For this, it's pretty straightforward that when Maria and Rosa went outside, Ava followed, and I don't think Ava even strictly speaking followed with intent to kill Rosa, but that there was an argument and a confrontation where they were speaking in private, and that led to a push, a shove, you know how these murders go, and then Rosa fell and perfectly fell on a place that would kill her instantly. A tragic mistake that then requires a murder to keep it quiet, because of course Maria's right there, Maria will tell people. And this is, this is the kind of desperate act where, motivation-wise, Ava cares a lot about being the head. Ava also wants to have her mountain of gold. Ava would probably not want to kill anybody. But in the moment when an accident has happened, Ava in desperation, I could fully imagine turning and strangling Maria. And that being the kind of tragedy where she wants her husband to ground her and pull her back from the brink, but might have to ask him to do that a little bit too late, a little bit after it's happened. A little bit where they now need to establish a retroactive alibi where he was by her side holding his hand to her head and she didn't leave for a moment. Ava was... Ava is such a complicated figure, and the first time through I had a lot of trouble sympathizing with her for a long time, but even in this episode, I don't think this will be her last murder, but will certainly not be the last murder enacted on her behalf, I still find myself sympathizing with her situation. Honestly, still more than Rosa, as much as Rosa's situation also sucks. But that is it for this video. We're getting into the thick of it. I don't think there's even that many parts left, so we're going to be dealing with a lot more murder situations and they're going to get more complicated. But until then, thank you for watching. See you next time.